Hi, I'm Lydia Halley. I'm a staff developer at Good Adversel, and I created this interactive web development quiz to create a single resource where you as a web developer can easily get exposed to all the different topics going from CSS to DNS to HTTP to JavaScript to web security to web performance to core web vitals, everything you need to know as a web developer all in one quiz. I hope you're up for the challenge and enjoy this course. We have a set timeout that um, has a callback with a log. Then we have a promise resolve with a then callback, which also logs two. Uh, we have a promise resolve with a then callback, which has a set timeout, which logs three. Then we have a new promise that uh, logs four and a set timeout that logs five. So what gets logged when we execute this script? So the right answer is D. It's four, two, one, five, three. So before, this is just the first time that you know we're using the event loop. So just to make sure everyone is on the same level, we have a call stack, which is just a stack that you know keeps track of the sequence of function calls in their execution context. So every time we call a function or even just a global context, it creates an execution cre execution context for that, which you know contains the code and any variables, everything it needs to execute, and then it pushes that to a call stack. And we've got a web API, which is just like a set of features that kind of extend JavaScript's you know, built-in functionality so we can use the web, uh, including like DOM manipulation, but also timers, set timeout, and fetch. Then we have the um, macro task queue, or just a task queue, uh, which contains all the set timeout callbacks, the set interval callbacks, any UI rendering tasks, user input events, and also network events. Then we have a micro task queue, which contains promise callbacks, uh, Q microtask callbacks, uh, any async await, and mutation observer callbacks. And then finally, we have the event loop, which is really just a loop that you know keeps track of like any tasks that are currently in the queue and then pushes those to the call stack. It's important to remember that first it wants to you know get all the microtasks out of the queue and then it goes back to the task queue, the normal task queue. So in this case, let's just go through it step by step. So first we have a set timeout call that just gets pushed to the call stack. But this set timeout itself is a web API, and the callback that we provided is actually pushed to the web API. Now we haven't defined any timer here. You know, normally you can do a set timeout and maybe like 2,000 or 3,000. In the case that we don't provide it, it's zero. But that doesn't mean that it gets executed right away. It still gets gets pushed to the web API, but it instantly gets then pushed back to the normal task queue on the next tick because the task queue had these set timeout uh, callbacks. So on the second line, we have the promise resolve, which just gets called. And when you call promise resolve, it just instantly returns a resolved promise. So it can instantly call the then function, which we provided, or that the promise resolve um, can access. And as we saw before, the micro task queue contains all the callbacks from uh, any promises. So the callback that we provided is scheduled as a micro task queue. Then we have another promise resolve, which works the same way. But this time, when it then gets called, it actually schedules the micro test queue again, but like, you know, it has the set timeout in here as well. But that doesn't run yet. It's just scheduled to run in the future. Now we have a new promise constructor, but the function that we pass to this new promise just runs synchronously. So it actually just, you know, runs this, the callback function and it logs four right away. So that's important to remember is that a new promise body runs synchronously. It only returns a promise. So four gets logged um, as the first value. And then we have another set timeout, which works the same way as we saw before. Set timeout gets pushed to the call stack, and its return callback um, gets first pushed to the web API and then back to that normal task queue. So now it's up to the event loop to see, like, all right, I've got some tasks queued up. But first, let's get rid of those micro, task, uh, micro tasks in the queue. So first, it, ha it invokes this callback, which locks two, get popped off this call stack. And then we have another callback that returns a set timeout. So it calls the set timeout, and set timeout again returns its callback to the web API, which eventually will log three. So on the next tick, this also gets pushed to the normal task queue. Now we have it again for, we have the, uh, where did, oh yeah, this set timeout callback uh, for the first one, which logs one. So one gets logged here, pushed off because there was no micro tasks anymore. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So it just like turned back to the normal task queue to like get rid of all the tasks there. Um, then we have the callback for logging five. So it just logs five and the same happens for three. Callback three invokes it, gets called, 
and eventually three gets called. So this is why we ended up with four, two, one, five, three. Order the CSS selectors by specificity, lowest to highest. A, B, C, D, E, or F. All right, so lowest to highest. So the right answer is F, E, D, A, B, C. Now, when we work with CSS, there are certain kind of specificity values that kind of like a tuple, tuple, I never know how to pronounce that, um, based on what the selector includes. So first we have inline styles, we have IDs, which get a higher value. Uh, then we have classes, attributes, and pseudo classes, which all kind of get the same or have the same priority. And then we have tags and pseudo elements. So just to see an example of this, here we just have one tag. We just have a UL, and that's a tag. So that is the for the, like that's the fourth, so the, the the weakest kind of. So this one is one tag, so it gets one. Then we add an ID. So now uh, its specificity is 101 because like there's zeros in between, so it's 101. Then we add another tag. Now it's 102. A class name 112. Uh, another tag 113, and so on. A pseudo class um, 123. Now, of course, if this was an inline style, it would just beat all of them because it has a thousand instead of 103. So when we go back to our question, or yeah, we see that the H1 is one tag. It has a class name and it has a uh, an ID. So this becomes 111. Then H1 large text and an attribute. So we have a class name and an attribute, which is the third one, so two. And then one tag is one, so 21. Um, same for a large text is a class name and then nth child is the pseudo class, so that one gets 20. Uh, with div h1, we have two tags. Then we have uh, a large text uh, class, yeah, so uh, 13 or 12. And then we have that pseudo element, the before, which is also in the, in the fourth one, so that becomes 13. Same for two tags, div h1, two, and then we have the pseudo element first child. Now it's kind of tricky because like you also have the not and the has, which is kind of like a pseudo elements, but not really. It doesn't get any specificity, um, even though it also uses, you know, that, what's it called, like parentheses? I don't know. Not parent. I don't know. Um, so you have like the tag, the h1, and then a not, which gets ignored. There is no value there, even though it looks like a pseudo element. It's not. <laughs> but then we still have the small text, which is a class name. So it gets 11. So here we have 111, 21, 20, 13, 12, 11. So that's why they're ordered like that. And normally, you will probably find selectors with like the same value specificity, then it just uh, depends on who, with, like, which one was specified last in the, in the style sheet. Because you also have like this entire, you know, like, like first you have inheritance, which is like the least or has the lowest priority, and then you have tags, which we just talked about, classes, IDs, inline styles, important in style sheets, and then important in inline styles. That one has the highest priority. If you're using an inline style with important, it just, you know, it just ignores everything else. It will use that. Um, yeah, so it goes from low to high. What statements are correct? HTTP 2 allows multiple requests and responsive, uh, responses concurrently over a single TCP connection. HTTP 3 can be used only with HTTPS. HTTP 2 is backward compatible with HTTP 1.1, or HTTP 1.1 requires multiple TCP connections to process multiple requests simultaneously. So the answer is all of them. <laughs> all of them are right. OK, so first, let's go back all the way in time when we had HTTP 1.0. And this HTTP always required a TCP connection before any response or request could get sent. So we always had to, you know, have the sin, sin, ak, ak before any request gets sent. So any, any file that you requested needed that. Um, then there was HTTP 1.1, which introduced like the persistent connections. Uh, so multiple requests and responses could be sent over the same TCP connection. Um, now, if you have a single connection, resources always have to be delivered in full before it can switch to like sending the new response. This is kind of called uh, head of line blocking, which wasn't great because yeah, it needed to like wait for other responses to like resolve stuff like that. So then there was HTTP two, which essentially allowed like multiple requests and responses to be streamed over the same TCP connection, but also simultaneously. So you could kind of parallelize the requests and the responses. Um, so this, uh, you know, reduced latency and just improved resource usage in general. Um, now we have like kind of a new thing called HTTP three. So this uses a new protocol called Quick. So it's, um, I mean, I think it was introduced in 2020, but it's already used by I believe 25% of browsers at the moment or like websites. 
So it's quite a lot, but it kind of gets rid of the entire TLS or TCP and TLS because uh, that's all combined in a new protocol called QUIC. Um, it also, again, has kind of streaming by default. So all the responses and requests can just be parallelized all at once. So this could massively improve your website's performance. Um, but of course, it's like up to the server whether you implement HTTP 3 or not. And also, uh, if the browser supports it, which at the moment, I'm not entirely sure how many browsers support it. I think the majority does, of like newer modern browsers. Yeah, so HTTP uh, allows multiple requests to be sent over the single TP TCP connection, that's right, as we just saw, like you can finally do that. Uh, HTTP 3 can only be used with HTTPS, and this is true because that quick protocol also has like the TLS like built in. So the TLS is essentially what, you know, like established that secure connection. With HTTP 2, this wasn't necessarily required. You could also use it with HTTP, but HTTP 3, you cannot do that. Um, HTTP 2 is backward compatible, yes, entirely. So if, you know, like you can either, so you can serve your website from HTTP 1.1 or 2. Um, and 1.1 required multiple TCP connections to process multiple requests simultaneously. That is true, um, like at the same time. Like you cannot send multiple requests at the same time with HTTP 1.1. I think you can with something called like, what's it called? Not parallelizing, I don't know, something else, but it wasn't entirely reliable. Not many people did that. Mm -hmm.